these folks back here too. I work with every one of these organizations on a regular basis. So I know you're going to have a good panel today. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. And if I can answer any questions or, or uh, provide any materials, we'll be over here for the rest of the morning. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you can hand it over. I think we have audio now. We had a little bit too much audio there for a minute. You can hear it now? Okay. So if you are online, you should be able to hear us. I know that we are live streaming on Facebook and YouTube, and we're recording it on Zoom so that we can post it later um, on our website to live forever because lots of folks actually like to review the videos um, even after the event. So um, for our sponsors, um, so we actually, okay, so Jeff was our, our feature sponsor. We usually have a slide up for him and I think it's in, he's, all of his information is in your handout if you're here in person. Um, we have Heather Jones here from Discovery Commons and we have Jill Gilmer here from Bright Star. Jill and her crew bring all the food. If you, so if you're here in person, or if you're not here in person, here's an incentive for you to come because they bring delicious food and coffee for us to eat in the back. So feel free to just get up and fill your plates if you need to. It's really um, just kind of laid back here. So, all right, uh, before we get, or well, we'll go ahead and get started. We'll have the panelists introduce themselves and tell just a quick you know, background why we asked you to, to be here. I, I've spoken to each one of you just frantically <laughs> uh, getting you here, which I appreciate. And um, so we'll tell our audience who you are and your, your area of expertise. Yep. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Davis, and I'm the VP of Business Development for Independent Adult Day Centers. Uh, my background consists of senior living expertise the past 10 years before I started with the day centers. I've worked uh, in uh, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, independent living facilities, and memory care. And now with the day centers that kind of incorporate the care of uh, many individuals uh, who, who need it. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Maria Holmes, and um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm with the Alzheimer's Association, a nonprofit. Uh, we have an office here in town, but we serve the whole country. Um, I am um, not from these shores, I'm from the UK. Um, <coughs> I came here about 14 years ago with my husband and uh, family, um, brought here with uh, Eli Lilly. Um, my career in the UK, I was an occupational therapist uh, for 20 years, and Primarily, I worked in the field of mental health. Uh, when I came here and eventually wanted to go back to work, they wouldn't have me. Uh, my qualifications were too old, and I'd have to go back to school to do a master's in occupational therapy, and I just really couldn't, couldn't imagine doing that. Um, but I volunteered at the Alzheimer's Association and um, sort of worked alongside this amazing social worker, and I thought, I want your job. <laughs> so I had to go back to school. And I did a master's in social work and I haven't progressed it at all. Um, I came out of uh, school in 2016 and they were really lucky. I was just very fortunate they had a job at the Alzheimer's Association, so it was wonderful. And I actually moved into that social worker's office. So she was actually my mentor for uh, several years uh, and she's since retired, but I've just been very happy to come about. And, um, yeah, I'll be here to talk about all the services that we have uh, at no cost to families who are dealing with um, Alzheimer's disease and or another type of dementia or something we call mild cognitive impairment. But we'll we'll get to that in a bit. All right. So my name is Karen Flowers. I am a caregiver options counselor with Sokoa Aging and In-Home Solutions. Um, I am a seminary educated registered nurse and social worker. Uh, I have a master's of peace and social transformation from Earlham School of Religion. Uh, professionally, social work wise, I've worked anything from uh, child welfare. I worked uh, a long time in health insurance, doing prior authorization work, uh, specialize a lot in Medicaid, I'm a little bit of a SME with Medicaid. Um, I've been with Sokoa since last February. Um, basically, I was finishing up my master's degree, had an internship with their strategy and innovation uh, department, fell in love with the organization, and decided to, you know, I wanted my next adventure to be with Sakala. And a lot of people know that they're the area agency on aging that serves Marion County and the Donut counties or the surrounding seven counties. 
and I work within the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Um, I work one-on-one -on -one with caregivers every day, seeking, um, uh, seeking creative solutions to kind of help people live their, their best life. And whatever that looks like as a caregiver, we all know it can be a broad range of really just about anything. So, but I'm very thankful to be here. So thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so in a nutshell, this is a very strong, intelligent uh, panel. So you guys have are lucky again to have some really great people who are um, experienced in the area of um, support for caregivers. So we appreciate you guys. Uh, okay, so how does your organization um, specifically support caregivers? Anybody can start. There's no order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes, so a little bit about independent adult day centers. We have three adult day centers across the greater Indianapolis area. So what that means is we provide care for those who need it during the daytime hours. So although my 10 year prior background is in senior living, residential living, uh, adult day is for just for the day. It is non-residential living. So adult day centers provide respite and caregiver relief during those daytime hours. And the schedule is Monday through Friday and can be very flexible. So maybe a caregiver just needs a break one day a week for four hours, or maybe they need to, maybe they're still working and they need a break and they need help five days a week or eight hours per day. So our adult day centers can provide that. And I can kind of go into some of the services that they provide too. So as a caregiver, I, you know your loved one best for, you know their condition and you know their daily needs that you may be providing for them. So the adult day center wants to help be a partner in that care and provide that care for the caregiver while they might need a rest from that or time away from that caregiving responsibility. So we do a thorough assessment of everything going on, the medical condition, the needs of the individual, and we prepare a whole care plan around that to include their medical needs and their social needs as well. We have a nurse at each one of our centers, so we can uh, be that medical model and a social model, providing those daily activities, engagement, socialization, as well as those medical needs including even bathing and showering, if that would be a relief for the caregiver. So that's in a nutshell, a little bit about the day centers. Um, I guess I did talk about our food program too. We do provide meals as well. That can be a much needed relief as well to have those really nice, well-prepared meals. We have a full service kitchen that prepares all of our meals daily that's included in the, the day center. Uh, Location-wise of our day centers, we have Fishers. We have Northwest Indy, which is off of Guyon Road, 86th in Michigan. And we have one just south of downtown. So really can cover the Marion County and Donut Counties, uh, depending on uh, where someone lives in relation to the centers, how we just find the best one that would support them. So that is kind of what we're known for is our day centers, our adult day centers. We can also provide caregiver support through our supporting services that not as many people know about yet. But under the umbrella of independent adult day centers, we also offer skilled home health care, meaning if someone needs physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, home health care that's ordered by a physician, we can also do that. We have non-medical home care too. So I like to mention to me, sometimes a caregiver needs more than one of the services. So we can have one of our services offered or a combination. So we have skilled home health care, non-medical home health care, or home care, which is more of companionship, running errands, groceries, things like that. And then we have another service called healthcare coordination. So I'm sure Karen knows about Indiana Healthcare Coordination. It's a great service that helps the coordination of doctor's appointments and the clinical care that an individual is receiving, as well as providing <coughs> transportation to those doctor's appointments. So as I get to interact with caregivers, I see the range from people managing those appointments. Does anybody here manage appointments for someone else or themselves? And you've got your, <laughs> you've got your notebook and your calendar and your phone and trying to figure out like, where did I put this or that? It's a lot to, to handle. Uh, so we provide that supportive service as well. 
So we have our day centers as well as three supporting services that can really help that continuum of care for an individual and their family. That's great. A lot, right? Yeah, and I, I actually was really impressed during COVID as well with, with your organization because uh, you were doing some home delivered meals as yeah. well with an activity for the day or a theme for the day. And when, oh, particularly when we had families dealing with dementia and looking after their loved ones at home, and it was bad enough that people couldn't visit their loved ones in, in a, you know, a memory care setting, but we had so many people isolated at, at home, as all oh, we were all isolated. But I just think for people with dementia, it was so, I knew families that had that service and it really just helped them frame their day and structure their day. Yeah. So I yeah. that was a really nice way of adapting during that. Continue that too. Oh, there you go. So um, as I said, I'm with the Alzheimer's Association. And so uh, primarily the caregivers that, that we're dealing with are ones that are taking care of somebody uh, with some form of dementia. And it could be very much in the early stages of that dementia. Um, and we, we sort of talk about um, care partners at that stage because they're just really partnering with their, with their loved one in these early stages. But it could be someone a bit further along as well in the middle stages or, or, or later stages. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we're very proud of um, our 24-hour helpline, 24-7. There's always somebody trained at the end of the phone uh, night or day, if they've got anyone's got a question or a concern uh, to, to, to reach out to, because we know this isn't a nine to five disease. You know, people have quite a lot of problems often in the evening and sometimes in the middle of the night. So um, we have our 24 7 helpline. If the last time it closed was on 9 11, quite simply because the phone lines were down. So, um, you know, no matter what, there's always somebody there. So we really want people to know that they're not on their own. Then more locally, you know, if someone phones the helpline and then it, it turns out that they're from Indianapolis and they really need to speak to someone locally, that will be get passed on down to us at the local um, office. Um, so here in Metro Indy, well, throughout the state really, we have caregiver support groups that we're also very proud of and we run them because we have really dedicated volunteers. They're either professionals that work in the field that want to volunteer uh, and give back all the people that have been caregivers in the past um, and um, you know they've got so much experience and they want to share that with, with current caregivers so our support groups happen um, if they happen they happen in the same place same time every month people don't need to register they can just come when they need to um, and as i said we've got i think currently we've got about 14 in the metro Indian area so um Really, they provide a safe space for people to come and talk about their concerns, but also to pick up uh, local recommendations of services and also to just pick up tips on how to manage. If somebody's having a, a practical problem at home, the likelihood is that someone else in that room has had a similar problem and come up with some ideas about how to cope. So we're very um, uh, proud of our support groups. We do a range of education programs. Uh, we come and speak to communities. Um, and we also have them these, these education programs online pre-recorded as well for people. And some of them are for the general public, but, but there are some core ones for people who are caregivers for people uh, dealing with uh, dementia. Um, really providing um, some basic understanding and some techniques on how to manage difficult situations um, our, our programs are really focused on. Um, uh, so we have those things, we have a range of, um, we have a fantastic website. I have provided a care support a little wrap card and we sent it, I think, through email as well, um, that just highlights the education programs, the support groups, the helpline. Um, and also locally, we have, um, I as a social worker can meet with families um, if they uh, need to talk through what they're dealing with. Um, and, and, and the goal is really to help people um, come up with an action plan about what steps they need to take because sometimes people are in the, they're in the thick of it or they've just been diagnosed no previous experience is really really overwhelming so um, uh, I will meet with families for a care consultation and you can also get that service um, on the helpline but we do have also in Metro Indy we have a very um, one of my favourite things is we have a program for people living in the early stages, for the caregivers and the person that they're caring for. Um, 
and it's, there's partly education, there's a support group that I, I do, but also a whole social program. Because what we really want people to do in the early stages of their diagnosis is to live well. There's still a good life to lead. Um, you've got to get your ducks in the row a little bit, um, but then you've got to focus on, on looking at your bucket list and having some fun and um, really keeping active and social, exercising, eating well, all those good things. But, um, so we have a program that's specifically for that. And I'm super proud that because of all the fundraising that other colleagues of my two and the community does, um, all our services are at no cost to anybody. So um, as a social worker, that's great. I don't have to bill anybody. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, we, we really um, think that the Alzheimer's Association is, is a really great resource. And um, I mean, we have current clients um, and uh, clients that we've been working with for quite some time um, that are caregivers for uh, a loved one with Alzheimer's. And um, it's just, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's really difficult. So we're glad you're here. All right, so Sakoa, what does Sakoa do? And how do they support caregivers? Well, I can say that Caregivers are actually an integral part of the actual mission of Sakala. Um, so our mission is to, what is it? Um, it is to connect uh, older adults, people of any age with a disability and their caregivers with the information, uh, resources and services that they essentially need to live their best life. I mean, that's not, the latter part is not part of the mission. It's my mm -hmm. mission as part of the caregiver support program. Uh, so the caregiver support program at Sakala is called CareAware. And I'm one of two uh, caregiver options counselors who uh, we work one on one with caregivers in order to really uh, listen to their story, to do active listening, and to get an understanding of where they're at in order to essentially help them live their best life. Um, and whatever kind of resources we connect them with, um, it could be a broad variety of different information, whether we connect them with uh, information on seeking funding for uh, in-home services so their loved one can can um, you know stay in the home or be in an assisted living there's different funding sources that you know we can educate about um, but basically um, I, I mean I will say as a former caregiver myself got into this work because I was the caregiver for my sister for several years prior to her passing. Um, she was a childhood brain cancer survivor where she was on a disability wait. She was on a waiting list for 10 years before she got services. And, and so I got to be that family resource in order to then be able to turn around. And how do I empower people to seek out the information that they need? Because it's about connecting with information. And a lot of times it's about knowing a phone number. Um, getting connected with a support group. It's about getting connected with a, you know, a day center. Um, it's really about th thinking, how can I best um, serve this person and empower them to uh, center themselves and their own health and well-being to make sure that they don't pass away before their loved one. I mean, there's, there, there are studies, uh, most recently, I'm always researching, I'm a little research nerd, but there was a recent study that indicated that almost 20% of caregivers pass before their loved one. And that's, that was jarring for me. Um, and if I can do anything to connect people with the information they need, then by all means, I will do it. So yeah, can you tell this group is passionate about what they do? <laughs> and something I love about the senior industry uh, is that most of us have a lot of times I don't consider myself a realtor because realtors are weird. And I just say that because I'm a realtor. <laughs> so I consider myself in the senior industry. Um, most of us have a connection to uh, a loved one that we either cared for or we went through that experience of helping them downsize or get their ducks in a row in terms of, you know, Alzheimer's care um, or, or something else. So um, that's what's really great. And I think that's why a lot everybody is passionate about what they do in the senior industry. So uh, good, I'll just pause real quick to see if there are any questions from our audience online or otherwise. Okay, good, we're moving right along. Okay, so what are common concerns you see directly affecting caregivers, both mentally and physically? I know we touched a little bit, you and I talked on the phone and uh, we, we both 
brought that statistic up about the caregiver is actually passing before the person who is being cared for. Um, so maybe elaborate on that. And um, again, common concerns directly affecting caregivers. Um, <laughs> uh, I think um, I was in a support group yesterday and um, somebody had, had, has their loved one actually in rehab at the moment. And she said, finally, she said, I can sleep. And, and the whole group agreed that they, their sleep pattern is really impacted when they're caring for somebody. Um, and if you think, I mean, it's such a struggle when you don't get a good night's sleep because you just can't function as well the next day. And if you're providing care and your patience has been pushed to the limit and you're just not on the top game because you're exhausted. Um, so I see, I, I think um, it, it just has a, a, a knock on effect, really. So if you're not sleeping, you're not functioning as well, then you're more prone to getting like, infections and colds and, and so forth. So I think uh, we often see people just, just very tired. Um, uh, so, and that, obviously then has a, an impact on their, on their physical well-being. And I would say that we also see a, just a whole gamut of feelings that, that come up with uh, dealing with specifically um, dementia. And it can range from just sheer frustration, maybe frustration that they, they don't know where to go to get help, or frustration and just the, you know, the constant rep repetition. That's the other key thing from our group yesterday was like, how do you manage this repetitive questioning that your loved one has? Because they don't remember that you, they asked the question five minutes ago and they're asking it again. And to have that all day long is exhausting. Um, so that can, you know, people talked about having little patience yesterday and feeling frustrated, um, but also huge sense of bereavement, grief and loss because day in, day out, they're slowly seeing their loved one change and and lose a little bit of their, who they were and, and, um, and their just functioning. So that grief could be there. Um, <clears throat> and many, many caregivers that I meet um, do have to seek uh, medical help for depression, for clinical depression. So yeah, it's, it's, it it's, can be all encompassing, really, some of the impacts of, um, of being. I'm glad you mentioned the sleep thing because I'm the sleep police in my house. And while I'm not caring for uh, older adults, I'm caring for children. And they know since they were little, if they ask to stay up late, they're counting the hours of sleep they get because I'm the sleep police. So, I mean, they are, to me, they need like nine to 12 hours of sleep. And same with me, if I don't get enough sleep, I'll get sick. And I can feel it coming. And I think that as a whole, we just forget about the importance of sleep and it compounds every single thing, um, you know, in, ter in terms of our health, mental and physical. So I'm glad you mentioned that. There's, I think there's a lot of research going on at the moment about in the world of sleep. Yeah. Um, and um, there is some, there's uh, quite strong evidence that if, if you're in your 50s and your 60s and you really get a regular night's sleep, every night you go to bed at the same time you get up at the same time you get and they say eight hours sleep on, on that regular basis that you can delay the onset of a dementia so it's really really important um because the sleep particularly like deep sleep apparently um i'm not a physician but apparently it cleans the brain you know it takes away some of the the proteins that um we see build up when we have dementia so um, and I'm, yeah, I'm a mum of a teenager and boy, I keep telling him, there's evidence to say if you get a good night's sleep regularly, you're going to be a better athlete. I'm still not, I'm still not cooking. <laughs> uh, My kids are sleepers. I mean, they love sleep. In the summertime, I mean, school started, we had to really readjust our schedule this past week. But um, yeah, so they're always counting their sleep because they know. I, I, I think it's very, very important. And I, I don't think it's something that we talk about enough just because it affects so much if you're not getting enough sleep. And it's free. It's well. totally free. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, we just solved the world's problems <laughs> right here. Just sleep. Everybody <laughs> sleep right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, wow. Another statistic, because I have it in my brain, is that one in, was it the AARP indicates that one in five people are family caregivers, unpaid family wow. caregivers in the United States. And that's, 
And that is, that is information that's been tracked. Think about the people who, you know, may be a family caregiver, but they don't, or they don't do those, uh, the hands-on, you know, I'm gonna help mom with her bath. You know, may, they may be uh, distance caregivers. They may be caring for, you know, a parent in California, or and that's still very much a caregiving experience. And so for me, I'm always mindful of the fact that uh, each caregiver's experience is different and you are the expert on your own life. And I will not, I will not be that person who steps in and says, I'm the expert. No, because you are the expert on your own life. You're the expert on your loved one. And, you know, it's about then, you know, getting sleep, getting, trying to get sleep, trying to, I mean, I'll be the first one to say, you know, I do like sweets. I like, you know, but I mean, but I try to, I try to fuel my body with nourishing food because with depression, and I'm saying this, you know, I mean, with my own, my own, my own experience is that, you know, there's the people, some people need a little judge of neurotransmitters and they need, you know, medical help. And then some people, it's a situational thing where they, you know, you know, they're not getting sleep or they're not nourishing their bodies or they're not getting exercise. And I think they really work together in order to help create the holistic, you know, persona of, of this person. But I really think that it's, it's important then for people to be able to tell their story, whether it's through connected connection with, you know, a caregiver, um, you know, like a support group or, you know, the caregiver support program has a COA or a counselor, you know, I mean, some people do need that extra counseling and it's, but it's a, it's a matter of recognizing if you are not a caregiver, you will be, or you are a caregiver for yourself. And so it's really about reimagining and integrating uh, health and well-being for yourself into our culture. And so it becomes a cultural shift in so many ways that you do not have to make sacrifices that, you know, yeah. So again, something I'm very passionate about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like and that's just good. Getting people connected with information that they need in order to, you know, live their best life is just something that I'm so, so into. So, all right, Sarah. Yeah, so an issue that I see facing a lot of caregivers that I work with is isolation. Um, isolation and Maria mentioned grief kind of go hand in hand and a caregiver support group that I'm involved in that I lead out, you know, uh, the caregiver will say, well, this isn't what I thought I'd be doing. I didn't think I would be a full-time caregiver for my husband with dementia or my sister uh, with mild cognitive impairment. This is not maybe what you thought you'd be doing in whatever age you are, whatever season of life you're in. And so there's that grief that kind of goes along with that. You have that love and that care and support and passion to take care of your person, but you might also feel that, oh, well, I was gonna travel or I was gonna do this or that with my girlfriends or whatnot. And so I hear a lot of that. And then isolation comes up in our group a lot too because they talk about um, people in their inner circle, maybe friends or family. I'm thinking of one individual in our group. She talks about not being invited to things. Uh, she feels like it's because it depends on if he's gonna be coming or with her or not, and that maybe others are uncomfortable around the person, that they don't understand the condition or don't understand the disease. Uh, so that feeling of isolation has come up quite a bit um, in our caregiver support group too. Great. Good. Um, so I was just going to, I had uh, a question, um, and I think you and I talked about it a little bit when we were on the phone too. Um, I see a lot of people who are caregivers, uh, they, either, they either try to diminish how far along the, the person is that they're caring for, like how much help they actually need, um, and also they, uh, we have a couple, a couple couples um, right now where uh, the caregiver is really trying to give a lot of dignity and grace to their loved one. Uh, and it's not always the, the, I mean, I don't know how to say it without sounding, you know, brash. Um, it's not always what's, what's the best um, for the situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, are you talking? Well, we we talked a lot about at least in preparation for this is about that caregiving can be a really traumatic experience. Um, whether it's big T trauma or little T trauma, it is traumatic to that person, and you know they're experiencing a whole wide range of emotions. So it's more than just grief. 
you can be angry, you can be sad, you can, it's about being able to kind of accept and embrace those emotions. And I think a lot of, a lot of people, it's very difficult to reach that point. So like for me, if I would, um, sometimes I make referrals to a memory <laughs> compass yeah, and, or I'll get them connected. I connect a lot of people with Catholic charities for counseling because it's like recognizing I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm a coach, a chaplain, and a cheerleader. I have somebody, one of my caregivers is like, that's what you are. And, and I know I figured out what is my piece to do and to be that support. But sometimes it's just nice to have someone who's not intimately involved in your situation yeah. to just be that friendly person and be like, hey, what can I help you with? You know, things have changed over the course of the month because you know how quickly things can change, you know, yeah, and on yeah. a dime. And it's about, hey, how is how was your month then? How was your week then? Um, but you're right with isolation, especially with COVID, but before, because I feel like caregiving can be a very isolating experience, even pre-COVID, because um, while we are social beings, there seems to be some sense of maybe shame or yeah. and, and, um, grief and shame that just rolled into all one little, one little ball. And it's about really, really kind of um, connecting with people, connecting with the people that you care about, but also, you know, recognizing that it's okay to experience the emotions that you're, you're experiencing, so. I think one example um, that I can think of just in, in our uh, line of work is that we have uh, some people who uh, really need to move out of their home and maybe into a, an environment where they have more support um, for themselves and their loved one. And um, a lot of times they'll, they'll do it, they think that doing it slowly over the course of you know, a few months is what's best. So if we have them going back and forth from you know, an apartment to their old house, to their new house, you know? and um, it just really, it's not, it's not the best, you know, we'd like them to just, I have another couple or another client who they are um, helping their uncle who has memory um, issues and they took him to go with family and then moved him, moving to another state. So when they, they brought him to his new place, they he didn't come back home. And while he didn't like it at first, um, I think that he's thriving now, he's really um, doing, doing better. And even though it sounds cool, I feel like that situation was a little bit better than just going, you know, back and forth. Yeah, yeah. My comment on that is, um, it's people feel very guilty, you know. Yes. So they sometimes think that doing it slowly, we're going to do this and this is better when it may not be. It may be better for the person to actually get the full care they need sooner than later. So it's kind of, you know, it's an act of caring for your loved one where, you know, like you were saying, it may sound harsh or, or be very hard to do and it might be very hard to do, but you have to kind of assess the situation as, is it the right thing to do for that person? And it's really the ultimate decision that a caregiver can make to get the individual the appropriate amount of care that they need when they need it versus delaying it um, to avoid emergency situations and things escalating on a dime as we talked about earlier. So we all work with families here and we think things could change daily or weekly. Um, things could change very quickly. I think you had a comment. Well, yeah, I think it's just very hard when caregivers are in the trenches and they're to, to sort of see the bigger picture. It's really hard to ask for help. Um, and sometimes they don't even know what help they need. And and I think if you've, if you've been married a very, very long time and you are completely committed to your loved one, um, it's just such a difficult thing to think that you, you can't cope and that you need help. And we always talk to people right from the beginning is that you cannot do this journey by yourself. It's just not doable. You're, you're you're going to completely, you're not going to be able to, to be there on the long-term basis doing it. You, you're going to get burnt out. And we don't want, I just, as I said, we don't want a crisis. So we're always talking about plan ahead a little bit. Then we can avoid a crisis. Usually the good decisions aren't made in a crisis. Usually we, we want to plan for things and, and know what our options are. So, yeah, we have to really try and encourage 
caregivers to that it's okay to ask for help and that might be what's needed to keep the whole show on the, on, on the road really is to um, have, have additional support um, and absolutely with you about the move particularly if you're caring for somebody with dementia um, we have a whole sort of tip sheet on, on, on those, those, those very things because um, it could be just too overwhelming the back was forwards and we, we, we suggest on move day that the person with dementia is taken out of the picture, they're taken out for dinner or lunch or whatever, and they have nothing to do with it, and they're just brought to the new location, hopefully with things set up, yeah. with some furniture, maybe some pictures on the wall, so that there's some familiarity there, and then start working on, on, on orientating them, which can take several weeks. Yeah. And so I'm really glad to hear you say that because it sounds cruel. They took Uncle Bruce um, over to Illinois to visit some family, knowing that he was never going to come back to the house. In the meantime, as soon as they left, he came in, got his stuff moved, and then the movers moved to Illinois. The, the, the cousin was there to unload the truck and set it up as like a miniature version of the house that he left. And so while he wasn't you know, he knew something was going on and he wasn't super happy um, at the beginning. It sounds cool, but he's settling in and doing much better now as opposed to going back and forth. We've had um, people do that and they're very confused. So yeah, I'm glad to hear and confirm that that is the right thing to do. Now we can really tell our clients that with confidence. I know Sarah, because Sarah came from the healthcare industry before she got a real estate license and she does give that advice um, to our clients. So, um, good. Uh, is there, were there any more, did you have a comment on that? Okay. And just as an adult day as an option. So if the 24 seven setting isn't quite what they're ready for, the caregiver's ready for, adult day as an option is um, <laughs> underutilized, I think. <laughs> so I, I love sharing that message. And just as a reminder, that alone could be the solution. Just adult day. And often we see folks come to our centers for several years and then, you know, things may progress to where they do need that 24 seven. Um, but oftentimes the day can give just the relief and the um, stimulation, socialization, care that they need even during those day hours. So consider a nap. A nap. A nap. <laughs> yes, the caregiver can take a nap yeah. yes, while they're at the day center. And that may do the trick for Harmony to be back for the caregiver. So, um, Consider that as an alternative too. Yeah, I, yeah. I, in my experience, I, I often when I mention day centers, people I think they're a little bit stigma around it, but they you know, and I also say you've just got to go and visit. Go and visit and visit a couple because they've all got, you know, I mean, your venues are beautiful, they're beautifully decorated, yeah. it's very spacious. There are some others that are, are smaller and more intimate, and, and but you need to, I, I encourage the caregivers to go and look initially just by themselves. Go and check them out because um, what what the day centre staff are really good at is welcoming people, I think, and bringing people in and knowing that it's a bit of a hurdle to get over that front step initially, but it can be, it really can help keep people at home for much longer. So, yeah, I think that's okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I remember. Okay. So, one of my teachers always asked, she always told me, she was like, Karen, when you are completely overwhelmed with everything that's going on, when you, you know, feel like you're riding a bike and juggling and, and, and then you know, playing the kazoo at the same time, what is the next best step in any given situation? And I always ask myself, and even personally, I'm like, because you know, we all go through personal stuff, but like, what is the next best step? And, and then when you make that next best step, what is the next best step? And that is, and that is really how you can work to um, center a caregiver can really work on center them, centering themselves and their own health and well-being because it's about reprogramming how you think and just what's the next best step. That's what <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Any questions? We do have uh, some folks that joined us online and they have confirmed they can hear. So we're winning the day today. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. What's the kind of open? Before dementia, early stage Alzheimer's, alerts and signs. Oh, that's a great question. 
what are some signs of early onset of Alzheimer's and maybe clarify the dementia piece too. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so we call dementia is the umbrella term. Um, that there's some something going on with your thinking and processing that's impacting your day-to-day -day -day living. Um, and but there are all types of dementia, there's lots of them. Alzheimer's disease is the most common one, um, and it's to do with some uh, proteins in the brain that are malfunctioning. Um, you'll hear the term plaques and tangles or um, amyloid and tau, but they're malfunctioning and they're causing blockages in the brain. Another type of dementia, which is the next one, is it most prominent is vascular dementia, and that's when you know you have a history of strokes and heart issues. Maybe your blood system's not working as well, and that's much more about how well the blood's getting to the brain, any particular brain. People with vascular dementia tend to have good days and bad days, and it's simply just like how well is that blood getting to the brain on, on that day. And you can have both, unfortunately, you can have Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And there are some other types of uh, less common, but we still see a lot of them. And it's all about what's uh, it's where it's starting in the brain and the sorts of symptoms are very little. But back to your question about, um, we, we have a program, it's, it's online, uh, which is called the 10 Warning Signs of uh, Alzheimer's Disease or, or Other Dementias. And so often people, um, we all forget, well I do, I mean, we all, as we age, we find it a bit more difficult to remember people's names. I have the situation where I walk in a room and I think, why have I walked in that room? So there are day-to-day -day things that happen as we age, which is just natural aging. But if you are having regularly like short-term memory problems and you're forgetting appointments or you're forgetting something that you scheduled with a friend, uh, that can be a little bit of a warning sign. If you are really starting to struggle, maybe with some word finding difficulty, um, that may be a sign. You don't have to have, we talk about the 10 warning signs, you don't have to have all 10 of them, you could just have you know, three or four that might raise, uh, raise the red flag. It can even be um, personality changes. Um, uh, there's a type of dementia that really impacts the front of the brain. You could be a lifelong Republican and start voting Democrat. <laughs> So sometimes you do see some quite dramatic personality changes. I'm a bit worried for the rest of the family. I would say that often, often it's the people around the person that notice the differences, notice the changes. And it's when a person often, if they've always, if they've always been the house accountant, if they've always managed the bills, and that's always been their strength, and suddenly they're either paying the bill double or they're missing paying bills. There's some, and you're seeing some practical changes um, that just, just aren't what that person was all about, then that could be another warning sign. So if you're seeing things that are happening that just don't feel that that's the right, that, that that's what that person would normally be doing, then it could be a red flag. And what we suggest in that situation is go see your, your family doctor. That's the first call. Just go, when you have your annual wellness visit, they can code um, and, and perform a little test, a couple of little tests, um, which will which will start to highlight, is there an issue? And if there is, they'll suggest, okay, maybe we need to do a bit more testing and send you to a specialist. Um, so, uh, yeah, then we do a whole hour talk on that, so. <laughs> You're actually asking yeah. I'll put on my nurse's cap for a hot second. Um, so, Checking in with your primary care doctor, not assuming that you do have Alzheimer's disease right out the gate, because they will they will run blood tests to make sure that your electrolytes are in, are in balance. So if your sodium is too high, it can create the same kind of symptoms. So it's a matter of checking in with your doctor and that they know your issues. And as a caregiver, that they know your issues because your doctor can be your best friend, particularly when you're getting connected with you know, home health for your for your loved one or a variety of things. But always, you know, it, it's it's not an automatic assumption. But yeah, just but a little bit of blood test can dispel a lot, a lot of sleepless nights, and we want you to get sleep. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I would mention is if you see some dramatic change in somebody or in yourself, like matter of hours or a couple of days, 
it's not likely to be, to be a dementia, it's likely to be a, a, an infection. So and it's just dramatic how a urinary tract infection can impact someone's functioning. It's just, if you haven't seen it, it's just amazing how the body works. It's treatable and, you know, they should go back to their baseline once treated. Okay. But any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question about costs for the day centers. So uh, it is covered by a couple of ways. Uh, the Medicaid waiver. So through SICOA, we partner with most, many of our clients, um, not all, but uh, many have the Medicaid waiver. Um, which is a program that SICOA will help get in place for um, an individual. Uh, so what we do, we help partner people with SICOA. They do the intake, the questions um, to determine if the person is eligible. If they're eligible, then they go through the process of assigning the waiver and it can be paid for that way. We also accept private pay. So if somebody is not eligible for the waiver at this time, folks can private pay. What we do is we do a four hour minimum. So for the first four hours, and it depends on what level of service or level of care the person needs, there is a rate with the first four hours. Uh, from there, a person can stay up to 10 hours is the maximum for a day. It is billed a quarter hour each quarter hour after that, which has a, a rate determined by the level of service the person needs. So whether they need uh, no care, they just come and they just can do their own thing, or they need assistance for medication administration, bathing, things like that is where the differentiation is. Yeah, so uh, uh, the level one, so if somebody needs a little bit of care is $47 for the first four hours. Very affordable. <laughs> 40, that's for the first four hours, not each hour for the first four hours. And then it goes to $67 on the highest level from there. Again, it would, there could be bathing or different charges add-ons if the person needed it. And how we determine that is we have our nurse and our center meet with the caregiver and the individual to develop that care plan. She goes through a series of thorough questions and develops that, that plan of service. A um, couple of, well, one other way, long-term care insurance. Some folks have a long-term care insurance policy and some of those policies have an adult day benefit. Not all, some. So if you have long-term care insurance, uh, that could be something to look into too if there's a benefit for adult day services. Yes, thank you for, yes, uh, the VA. Yes, we are, we do work with the VA who also provides a similar benefit to where the person would apply, go through the process with the VA, and then it is funded that way as well. Great alternative too. I was just going to say, uh, so we have talked about long-term care insurance in previous events, and we'll continue talking about that. It's a pretty well-attended um, event. And then in October, we're also going to be talking about Medicare, Medicaid, and the Medicare supplements and things like that. So, the calendar. so uh, in order to pay for things like adult days. And I think that's, um, I guess, if I was caring for somebody that needed to be bathed, I might just paid $47. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and sometimes they do it better. Yeah. For right. Someone else. Yeah. Because you have the, uh, you have the tools and the training. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Choice, 
situation. So I'm just going to repeat the comment question real quick for the online audience and for when they play it back, because I know they won't be able to hear. So in a nutshell, uh, our attendee here in person was a caretaker for a mother and really did quite a number in terms of sleep and trying to care for her. Um, and uh, some of the just out of control chaotic behaviors that can happen uh, with someone who has Alzheimer's. Um, and the question was, how do you handle that? It made me think of our family reunion mom that we went to. I have an aunt who has Alzheimer's and she, we were sitting there and um, just talking, you know, family reunion. And she said, oh yeah, we got robbed. And she had details about what happened. We came in and I knew what was happening just because of our experience here, but her daughter, my other cousin was in the background going like, you know, and I'm like, you know, I, I know what's going on, but I, I just went with it, I mean, you know, uh, and so that does happen. And when you talked about the stories and they're calling 911 and saying the most asinine things are happening, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? So I would say um, I mean, every behavior is, it is can be really, I mean, I think just explain how, how incredibly challenging it can be. And I've had similar situations where, you know, the, 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 the person with dementia is, is, has walked out into the local community, stood in the middle of the street, said, he is kidnapping me. And just, you know, all these, you know, and it, it is. Um, Part of it as caregivers, we have to understand what's going on for that person. Obviously, their, their reality is completely skewed. And in their brain, this is what's happening to them. This is what they truly believe. So we first of all have to recognize that. Um, I think um, when I work with families, and it's, you have to really <coughs> sit down and look at the <coughs> um, specific situation and, and brainstorm, okay, what can we do in that situation? It's a lot about working with other agencies. In that particular case, the caregiver had a letter, a formal letter on headed note paper from the neurologist that explained um, her behavior um, and a contact details if, if, if they didn't trust the letter. Um, but his letter, he showed it to me, it was so worn thin 
because he was constantly having to, to bring it out. Uh, the other thing that um, we encourage a lot of uh, people to carry is a little card that says, please be patient, the person I'm with has Alzheimer's disease. And that has saved people's uh, uh, not lives, but it's been, it has been really useful. I've, I've had, I, one lady told me that they drove into, she and her husband drove into a gas station and all along the car journey, this car had been overtaking them and it was, it was a bit aggressive, but her loved one with dementia was making hand gestures and signals to this car driver. So it was escalating into an aggressive situation. And she pulled into the gas station and he pulled, pulled in as well. And she jumped out the car and she threw this car in front of him and it stopped him. Um, so that can be, because sometimes you can't say, oh, my, my loved one here has got Alzheimer's disease, because that would just escalate the whole thing. Um, so sometimes that's a handy little tool. But it is trying to work and it is trying to work with your local agencies so they do, do know who you are. So if you're in a smaller community, it's reaching out to the local sheriff's department and letting them know um, that you know, this person has dementia and they're, you know, because, and actually, if you are in a smaller community and they do get called, they are going to get to know you. So knowing ahead of time, and there is a way that they can put that in the system as well to have it recorded. Are you able to call it? You can do, yes. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. And we really encourage that. If you've got someone that's prone to being more difficult, prone to wandering, wandering at night, you know, you, you want your local agencies as best you can to know, and your neighbours. Um, uh, so there's not one clear answer about how you deal with it. It is, it is a, you know, but. Yeah. And, then, and quite frankly, I mean, um, sometimes I believe, so I'm with you, I get really worried when caregivers say to me, I promised mum I'm never going to put her in a home, and I'm not going to put her in a home. If she has dementia, she's not going to remember anyway. <laughs> yeah, so you right. the promise. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just, it, it's, nobody wants to do it. And yeah. it's, it's really, and it is really hard. Uh, but I always say to people that it, it really worries me when I hear that because, you know what, well, it, at some point it might be the very best thing that you could do for that person because they need 24 hour care. So, um, it, it, I, my, mom's, my mom is in the UK, she's 90. Um, she hasn't got dementia, but who knows what the next few years will bring. Um, and she worked in a, a, a home for older, older folks, and she's really mad that she doesn't want to go into a home. But I still avoid <laughs> I'm probably not a very good daughter in her eyes, but I just, because I know seriously that I can't promise her that. I will do my utmost I will, to, to, to manage, but yeah. So. Well, also, I think your communities are not like what they used to be exactly so making that promise maybe 30 or 40 years ago you know it's not like people are just sitting in wheelchairs in the hallways with droll sitting there waiting to die i mean clearly there are different levels of care and um i had so many things that came to mind as you were talking um the one guy that moved to illinois they they I don't know because if they because they were moving from one state to another if they didn't do uh, the proper evaluation or or what. But he started off in well, I'll take that back. I mean, I know there are some some communities have two different levels of um, memory care in one block and one's not. Well, he started in an unlocked area and he was walking down the street. And so they had to move his apartment when we got there, which I'm sure was a huge disruption. But I mean, if they would have started in the, the locked area, we know people will find people just walking down the middle of the street. Um, I don't remember what else came to mind, but um, just the behaviors are things that you can't even imagine, like the hand gestures and things. I can't imagine. Like, yeah, you really can't. And you know what? And you mentioned uh, that this. 
you mentioned that uh, she mentioned that her mom was like a really sharp lady college professor. And I tell you what, it's it's like that's that's it's the prime person who who that could happen to, unfortunately. We have a gal in uh, senior community who is a sponsor here with us at Clearwater, five star residents at Clearwater, and we're selling their property and I go in frequently to talk to the husband and uh, he had, okay, this is my other point. I was thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to remember all this stuff, but I got to wait. I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> um, so he, uh, the husband is the primary caretaker. Uh, they, he, they moved into a, a community and he was over her medication, but he's not a doctor. He's not a nurse. He would see her taking medication and she was getting better. And then he would slack off on the medication and she was awful. I went in there. She um, had an accident in her pants. She was roaming around, you know, the halls. She thought that I was his mistress and I was there, you know, um, and she looked me right in the eye and said, I don't like you. Don't touch me, you know, and it was clear that um, it just, it, he wasn't keeping up on her medication. Um, and so the community stepped in and now our visits are much more peaceful. Um, and, and so, and he's able to get a little bit of reprieve as well because he's not chasing her around the building. So. I was just gonna, you know, plug Sabella again because the Aging and Disability Resource Center is the gateway for funding sources for the Aged and Disabled Waiver and also for choice funding, which is uh, funding that's through the state of Indiana. That um, so with the Aged and Disabled Waiver, uh, a person there's a two pronged eligibility process. They look at uh, basically eight different areas that screen somehow someone does their activities of daily living. So I thought of the medication management is a huge one. Medication management, bathing, dressing, uh, toileting, eating, if they have skilled needs, like if they have uh, wounds that need to be staged by a nurse, if they have a G-tube, if they have a tracheostomy, that's a skilled need. Um, a transfer, how do you transfer out of the chair? Do you use the wall? Do you use furniture? Like that's, that's uh, a level of um, assistance that could necessitate possibilities for in-home funding for in-home services. Um, so, and then there's also the eligibility component, which there, we use, a, it's called a special income limit and a special asset limit in order to uh, potentially allow for a broader variety of different types of funding for people. Um, and, you know, if you don't meet financially, there's a lovely gentleman over here who is worth his weight in gold, who um, elder law attorneys um, can assist with Medicaid planning is the term. And you, you let them know Medicaid planning and they will run with it. They, they, can, they can situate things in order to um, assist with establishing funding sources. So I say all of that in the fact of there is a possibility. It's not prohibitive. Um, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be rich. Yeah. Um, and, and so the Aged and Disabled Waiver essentially acts as an extension of traditional Medicaid in order to allow someone to stay in their home. If that is, if that is what you want, then that's potentially funding that can be in place. But again, there's a screening process. You would call the Aging and Disability Resource Center, um, which is again, what I work under. I can do options counseling. I work primarily with caregivers, but I can do the regular options counseling. But it's about figuring out, um, but also consent is essential. You cannot assess someone without their consent. Now granted, if you are a legal guardian of someone, that is, that's a something but we want them, if they can answer our question or if they, if they can give verbal consent to assess for starting that process, we want them to be party to the situation. So we want them to know because they're still their own people, you know? Like they have, they have rights, they have privileges, you know? We need to respect, it's about respecting the individual's rights and privileges as well. So, but yes, so you don't have to be rich. So <laughs> you don't have to be rich. You had a comment. Yes, uh, back to what you mentioned about the hospice company kind of came in and saved your life there at the end. So just want to commend you and everyone here today as caregivers, maybe the hardest thing to do, but doing what you're doing today and coming out, getting resources, learning what those options are, because there are so many options out there 
and then just learning about them, educating yourself and understanding what would be the best option for your situation, for your financial situation at the time, and what that plan looks like. So I just wanted to mention that as caregivers, again, at the time it takes to maybe even step away from that caregiving role to find the resources can be challenging, but as much as you can do that, that is a recommendation I would have for that situation is just really wrapping your arms around the resources and community that's available and out there because they, they will help save you. Just, you know, eventually when you found the hospice company, however that was recommended to you, was wonderful for you. So uh, just use the resources and, yep. Yeah, this might, I don't know, caregiver support groups existed, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah, I remember saying, like, the yeah. community of senior living and the options and support that is out there is different than it was 20 yeah. years ago or 40 years ago or whatever. It's, it's changed it's a lot. Developed. It's pretty awesome, yeah. too, what's out there. Yeah. It evolved and developed as, as, as anything should, so, which is great for, for us, so... Uh, okay, I just looked at the clock, it's 11.15, and I don't remember where we are. What, uh, how can we support our friends and family members who are caregiving, and um, what is, you know, the best piece of advice that you can leave with us if we are caregivers or we find ourselves um, in a caregiving situation, or we know somebody, a neighbor, somebody we go to church with, or we work with, a friend that maybe we're in a book club with, uh, something like that. You hear them, you know, maybe lamenting about their situation. What can we tell them? Uh, I thought, where do I start when you were mentioning the options, counseling, and everything? Um, one thing, I think you could call anybody in this room um, on the side or up here and uh, just explain the situation and if we can't help we'll direct you to the person who can um so that i mean that would be my best piece of advice so what about you guys go ahead oh <laughs> i would say i would say the best thing you can do for you know friends loved ones anyone who is a caregiver is to be present be present with them be present for them um so and not to ask yes no questions like can i help you Usually people will say no, right? Like it's about offering, let me make you a meal. Let me sit with grandma for three hours so you can go get a pedicure. Like it's, it's about making yourself available, but also recognizing there's responsibility that's tied to making yourself available. And that's how, I mean, we are social, social beings. You know, it's about connecting with each other, but really being present for people and yeah, what was the last question? Your other question? Your best piece of advice oh my to the room, online and in person. Um, well, number one, go check out sacoa.org. You know, really <laughs> comprehensive <laughs> website. How do you spell that? <laughs> How do you spell that? Okay. C-I-C-O-A, it does not stand for anything it used to. <laughs> it, is a, it is the Central Indiana Council on Aging, but now it is just Sequoia. And we have, we have a, you know, a, a broad variety of different kinds of resources on our website. And I would say I would reiterate the best advice is to ask yourself in any given situation, what is the next best step? And once you make that step, to go to the next step and the next step. Because it's about, it's about retraining your brain to center your own health and well-being um, so you don't become that statistic of passing before your loved one. And it's about making yourself a priority. So there's no reason to feel guilty about it. No, don't feel guilty about it. No. We're human. We're all just people. And it's about, you know what it, you mentioned about just reaching out to someone in the room. Hey, I got a question. I don't know who to go to. And I'll be like, I can get you booked up. Let me get you phone numbers. We like doing that. We like, I like people at, from this event, they text me all the time asking me for so-and-so's number or, or their call. And I, I love being able to, you know, pass on Jeff Benson's information or uh, tell them to go to the Discovery Commons to see how they're, I mean, we love doing that. And I think it's the same for, for yeah. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I would say I'll end on the best piece of advice is give yourself permission 
and that can take on multiple forms. So give yourself permission to let go of that guilt. If that promise is outdated and just doesn't apply anymore, and you know that it's the best thing, it's the right thing to do for this person's care, it's going to protect their dignity, their wellness, and maybe help them live longer, it's the right thing to do. Give yourself permission. Give yourself permission to take that help that Karen was explaining. If you've got someone in your circle who says, can I help or can I bring a meal? Or, I'm going to bring a meal. Let me come stay with grandma for an hour. Give yourself permission to take that help. Take it. Every minute, every hour matters for you to have your moment because you can't pour from an empty cup as a caregiver. So give yourself permission to take that help and give yourself permission to take time for you. The fact that you can't pour from an empty cup, give yourself that permission. You need to do it so you can be the best caregiver you can be and help your loved one uh, thrive as best as possible. These ladies know their stuff. It's great advice. Um, uh, I would just add that um, if you know a family that is dealing with dementia, and it is really hard to ask for help, as we talked about earlier, and sometimes you don't know what to ask for. Um, but if you do commit to doing something, um, our, the families that I deal with, they really need it. Caregivers need a regular break. They need to, and they need to be on a regular schedule. And that's what they tell me is that they can cope if they know that Thursday morning is their morning. So if if people can consider, you know what, I can make that on my schedule regularly. I can do every Thursday morning for a couple of hours. I can come and sit with a person. And that person that they're sitting with benefits because they've got somebody else to talk to. Maybe they can do some activity. Um, so that's good for the person with dementia, but it then gives a really regular break for the caregiver. So if you can offer something on a regular basis, that's really wonderful. I just wanted to add to that. Thank you for that caregiver does not include grocery shopping, doctor's appointments. Like they need a real break. So those things need to be done too, but they need to do something. I don't qualify that. <laughs> I'm yeah. just going to say real quick, um, if you need to figure out what that break needs to entail, you need to ask yourself, what brings me joy? Yeah. What brings me joy? And if something brings you joy, that is what you need to do for your break. If it happens to be grocery shopping, first of all, you're weird. <laughs> and we're not friends. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but... Yeah, what brings you joy? I think about, you guys have probably heard this analogy too, like uh, when you're on a plane and the flight attendant yeah. says, um, you're sitting next to a child or somebody needs your assistance and we need to put our oxygen masks on, you put yours on first and then you help the person next to you because if you're dying and you can't breathe, you're not going to be able to help the person next to you. So instead of one person dying, now we have two. So, yeah. Any questions, general questions or comments? Yes. Yeah. I, I took care of my husband as a caregiver for several years, and um, I found that I didn't realize it because he passed away years or so ago. I had such a pile of little time on priorities for so long and didn't realize that until we got him into our place. So, but suddenly, all of a sudden, and I had great family help and all kinds of things. They talked about if he was wandering or something, that when you call the police, you always say missing. The person is missing. So that they know right away that they're going to be dealing with someone who is, you know, wandering or falling off. Yeah. yeah. And I really picked that up from that. Yeah. He didn't wander because he had some knee problems, but I never knew him, you know, that away. And I thought, how comforting that was to me if I should call the police because um, I guess it, and that's the magic word. And that was very helpful to me. Yeah. And also, I must comment, this meeting was very helpful to me. Oh, we appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I know, I, we're going on seven years and I, some of you are the OGs at this meeting. Like, <laughs> seven years, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah. So when you when you mention high alert, I think of like uh, you're in stress, like your fight or flight neurotransmitters are activated, and you cannot. None of us we cannot sustain that level of what you call high alert uh, for a regular a regular uh, amount of time. Our body will just shut down. Yeah, literally shut down. Yes. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, two hours of sleep, and then you were on and off, and that sleep wasn't deep sleep. As I think of as a mom to my kids, if they're not in bed, I can't go to sleep. I mean, now they're older, you know, I just go to sleep. <laughs> Before, you know, the sleep police, yeah, or the sense of sleep police, because I get them on to my own sleep too. But, um, you know, if they're not in bed, you can't really get that sleep and if you're if you're the caretaker for somebody who is either the behaviors are so um uh, erratic yeah erratic and, and inconsistent you just can't you know at least my kids their behaviors are not so erratic with a grain of salt <laughs> some people might think they were i came home the other day to my daughter laying in the driveway so <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, but you, you cannot maintain that level. Our bodies will they will shut down. It's scientifically proven. So yeah. I just wanted to comment as I'm not involved with this. You can't take the caregiver to ask for help. Yeah, and they think they can give it all when you can see that they're just about at their wits. Yeah, and maybe you know somebody like that. The comment was. Um, it's tough to get a caregiver to actually ask for help. And I think that's why you said, don't ask yes or no questions. Maybe don't even ask the question. Just say, I'm coming over and you're leaving and you're going to go get a mini petty and I'm going to stay here and take care of things. I think people, yeah. 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 I mean, they need professional help. Yeah. 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 And sometimes they don't even know that's what they need. So, uh, for you in the room, you do know somebody who is a caretaker. You can come alongside that person by just keeping them out of the house and put them in an Uber or to a nail salon or a bar or wherever they need to go. <laughs> Whatever brings them joy. Whatever brings them joy. And say, go away. I'm coming, you know, I'm taking care of things for now. So, yeah. Anything else? Okay, well. Ladies, this was so great. Thank you all for, for being here and sharing the information. So,